Steinhauer here, welcome back. Um, I wanna bring begin this class with a review question of the material that we covered last time. It's a pretty simple one. We've got three bright stars here. In fact, these are three of the brighter stars in the sky, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And in fact, they make up a common asterism that's visible in the summer sky in the Northern Hemisphere called the Summer Triangle. Uh, Vega in the constellation Lyra, Deneb in the constellation Cygnus the Swan, and Altair in the constellation Aquila the Eagle make up a nice, very large, very prominent right triangle uh, that's visible high in the evening sky in the Northern Hemisphere in the summertime. Anyway, I've given you the magnitudes of each of these stars, 0, 1, 0.3, and 8. The question is, which one is the brightest? So go ahead and pause the video, make a guess, and we'll come back and talk about the answer. Okay. Um, now, magnitude, you might remember, is the weird scale by which astronomers measure the brightnesses of things. And the magnitude system is weird in a couple of ways. It's logarithmic, and also it is backwards. So the smaller the number, the brighter the star. So in this particular case, Vega, having the smallest number of magnitude, is the brightest star of these three. Uh, Altair would be the next brightest, and Deneb would be the next. Okay, so um, moving on, we are, we've talked about brightness and how we measure it in astronomy. Uh, we've also mentioned luminosity in this class. Uh, it's time to bring those two concepts together, really understand the difference between them and also how they're related. So here is the basic definitions of luminosity and apparent brightness. Luminosity is an intrinsic property of an object. It is how much total energy that object is radiating into space per unit time, right? So this is a property that's intrinsic to the object. It doesn't matter where that object is. It doesn't matter how far away that object is. That object's luminosity is an intrinsic property of that object. And the units on luminosity are uh, energy per, per unit time or joules per second or watts. So when you, when you plug in or, or turn on your 45 watt light bulb, what is that saying? That, li that light bulb is consuming 45 joules of energy per second. And if it's perfectly efficient, it would be radiating 45 joules of energy per second into space. So that's luminosity. It's an intrinsic property of the object. A bright, what we usually call brightness, I'm gonna call apparent brightness here, is not an intrinsic property of that object. That is how bright something appears to us. And it still has units of watts or joules per second, but that's not the only unit in there because we measure apparent brightness by how much of that energy actually reaches us. And by reaches us, I mean passes through some aperture that we're using to collect it on Earth. That aperture could be a telescope, it could be our eyes, it could be anything that we're using to detect it is going to be the aperture. Um, but so we, we've got a, another unit that has to be in here um, for, for apparent brightness. And that is uh, watts per square meter is the actual unit on apparent brightness. Um, and you can see this is related to how far away an object is. You can sort of see in these, in these rays here, right? As those rays expand out, fewer and fewer of them will pass through a particular aperture that we happen to throw down, let's say, on the Earth. And so apparent brightness is, is, is dependent on how far away that object is. The further away it is, the lower the apparent brightness will be. Now, what is the uh, relationship? There's actually a relationship between luminosity and apparent brightness and distance, and that's the topic of the next slide. Um, so how are these two related? It turn, so, so again, if you've got some light bulb at the center of your object, center of your, your um, you've got some light bulb in space and it's radiating energy into space, that energy that it radiates into space gets spread over a bigger and bigger area as it moves away. Let's consider all of the energy that this light bulb, although it could be a star or anything that's, that's radiating uniformly into space, let's consider all of the energy that it emits over the course of a second, right? So, in a particular second, it's emitted a lot of energy, and that energy is expanding outwards in all directions at the speed of light. And as it expands out, the total amount of energy that's contained in that one second of, 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 uh, of emittance 
is not going down. It's the same amount of energy, but it's getting spread over a larger and larger area. And you can see that in this diagram, right? Let's take a particular section of, uh, of, the, of the sphere that surrounds this light bulb as it expands. And let's say that this light, this, this area has a, as a um, this region has an area of one unit. It doesn't matter what the unit is, right? When you, by the time that light uh, segment has gotten out another factor of two away, right? So in other words, the entire amount of energy that that light bulb radiated in that second is now contained on the sphere. Sometime later, that sphere has gotten twice as big as that light continues to expand outwards. Well, what happens? Well, the same amount of energy that was passing through this one unit of square area in the first shell is passing now through a much larger area on the second shell because all of those rays are expanding outwards. In fact, if this distance for the second shell is exactly twice as big as the distance to the first shell, then the total area, total amount of light that was passing through this one is now passing through four of them at, at a radius of two meters. And at a radius of three meters, that same amount of energy is passing through a, a region whose area is, is got nine of those same area units as the first one. And so this, this is the one over R, R squared law of light. The further away a the further away from an object you get, the fainter it looks by one over the distance squared. And, and this, is, this is understandable because you're spreading that total energy that's been emitted in that time over a, a sphere that's getting larger and larger with time. And if you remember the radius of a, the area of the surface area of a sphere, it's four pi times the radius squared. And so, the the area that that the energy isn't the amount of energy that's spread over that isn't changing, but it's being spread over a larger and larger area as the radius, as the distance from that object gets larger and larger. So uh, this is the general uh, picture on why that works that way. But really, that leads us to the brightness luminosity distance equation, which is the brightness that we see an object at is equal to its luminosity. It's a it's how much energy it's actually giving off per second, divided by the surface area of that sphere that is a radius, the distance away from that object. Because that is the area over which that energy has been uh, distributed in the time that it's taken for light to reach us from that object. So this is an important equation, brightness, and luminosity are related by distance by this particular equation. Now, this is important for lots of reasons, but one of them is we can turn this around, right? If we, if we know an object's bright, we can always measure an object's brightness. This is easy to measure. If we know, happen to know an object's luminosity also, then we can actually determine the distance to that object. That's called the method of standard candles. A standard candle is, a, is an object whose luminosity we know. All then we need to do is measure the brightness and we can measure the distance. Also, if we know the distance, this is also important. Sometimes we don't, it's not a standard candle, but we're interested in knowing how luminous it is, how much energy it's giving off. If we can measure the distance to that object, of course, we can solve this equation at, for luminosity and calculate the luminosity of that object uh, because the brightness, again, is easy to measure um, with telescopes. Okay, great. So that's fun. Uh, let's do a quick example. Um, the brightness of the sun at the earth is 1300 watts per square meter. This is actually an important number. Uh, this is called the solar constant. And this is, again, if you're building a anything that's going to generate energy by solar power, this is the number you're starting with. If you build a one square meter um, solar collector, it can it will receive a maximum of 1300 watts or joules of energy per second. Uh, and so that's the maximum you could possibly get with a 100% efficient solar collector. Now, most solar collectors, no solar collector is 100% efficient. And even the best solar 
collectors these days are in the five to 10% range. So you're, you're only down from there. But this is the number you start with. This is the actual number, this is the actual brightness of the sun as seen from the earth. The total number of energy, total amount of energy per second passing through every square meter um, on the surface of the sun. So the question is, how bright, what is the brightness of the sun at Pluto? And Pluto's uh, distance from the sun, its semi-major axis is 40 astronomical units. And that is 40 times further away from the sun than the earth is. And so we're gonna expect it to be fainter, but the question is how much fainter? Well, let's, let's, let's do the calculation. We know that the brightness is equal to the luminosity divided by four pi times the distance squared, right? And that's gonna be both for Pluto and for the Earth. So let's, let's, do, let's do this twice. We can say the brightness of the Earth, the brightness of the sun at the Earth is equal to the luminosity of the sun divided by four pi times the distance between the Earth and the sun. And we can say that the brightness at Pluto is the luminosity divided by four pi times the distance squared. The distance has changed. This is now the distance to Pluto, but the luminosity is the same. This is the sun, and this is just still the luminosity of the sun, right? So we can, um, we could, we could, if we knew the luminosity of the sun, we wouldn't even need the brightness of the earth to do this, to do this problem. But we're given the brightness of the earth, so without even knowing the luminosity of the sun, we can actually make this calculation. Let's see how that works. Let's take a ratio. Taking a ratio is always a fun and good thing to do. So if I want, let's say, the brightness at the Earth divided by the brightness at Pluto, not the right, the right word there, divided by the brightness at Pluto, then I can just take each of these and divide them by each other, right? The brightness at the Earth is ls divided by four pi times distance to the earth squared. And the brightness at Pluto is the luminosity of the sun divided by four pi times the distance to Pluto squared. Lots of stuff cancel out here. And that's the beauty of taking ratios. The luminosity of the sun, it's on the top and the bottom, it goes away. This four pi, four pi term, it's on the denominator of both the numerator and the denominator. And so it goes away also. And so what do we have? This is equal to one over DE squared divided by one over DP squared. This gets a little confusing, but it turns out you can move, let, let's, let's try to think this out. This is one over DE squared. Let's just call that what it is. One over one over DP squared though is just DP squared. So this becomes dp squared divided by de squared. And this is de divided by dp, the brightness at Earth divided by the brightness of Pluto. And if you even want to do more fancy stuff, you can take both of these and put them inside a single single uh, square term. So you can, in other words, do the div division first. This is dp divided by de, and that's quantity squared. OK, so that's, that's the 1 over r squared law of light. This is what we mean by one over r squared. The brightness goes down as one over the distance to that object squared. So let's, uh, again, we know, we know what these distances are, right? We know that dp is 40 astronomical units. And we know that da or de, the distance to the Earth, is one astronomical unit. So dp divided by de is just 40. And 40 squared is what? Well, you can plug it into your calculator, but I'm here to tell you it's 1600. So the brightness at Earth divided by the brightness at Pluto is 1600. So the sun is 1600 times brighter as seen from the Earth than it is as seen from Pluto. So we can take this whole thing now and solve for the brightness of Pluto. If we multiply both sides by dp, They cancel out over here. And if we divide both sides by 1600, 
they cancel out over here. And we're left with, if I haven't given myself enough room, we'll come back over here. BP equals BE divided by 1600. That's great. But we know what BE is. It's 1300 watts per square meter. So if we can plug that in, we get 1300 watts per square meter divided by 1600. And that number is 0 0.81 watts per square meter. And even though it's jumbled up over here, that is our answer. So 1300 watts per square meter is the solar constant, the brightness of the sun as seen from the earth. From Pluto, it's less than a single watt per square meter. That's why it gets so much colder as you move towards the outer part of the solar system. The energy that those planets receive from the light go down as one over the distance squared away from the sun. And Pluto is way out there at 40 astronomical. Okay, here's a thought question for you. Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us. Uh, it's not visible from the Northern Hemisphere, at least in Geneseo, um, but it is a bright star in the, southern, in, the, in the Southern Hemisphere. The question is, how would the apparent brightness of Alpha Centauri change if it were three times further away? Would it be only a third as bright? Would it be only a sixth as bright? Would it be only a ninth as bright? Or would it be three times brighter? Go ahead and think about this. Write it down, answer it, and we'll come back and, and talk about it after you. Okay, again, this is how does one, uh, one quantity relate to another quantity? And so, again, what is our brightness formula? It is B equals L over 4 pi times D squared. Nothing is changing here. The luminosity isn't changing except for the distance, right? So the question is, if you were to change the distance by a factor of three, make it three times further away, how would that affect the brightness? Well, none of this stuff changed. It's only the one over D squared. The fact that this D is on the bottom means it's getting fainter, means as the distance goes up, the brightness goes down. So that eliminates D as a possible answer. How much fainter will it be? Well, if this weren't D squared, if this were just a D, then if you increase D by a factor of three, then B would decrease by a factor of three. But there is the square there. So if you increase this D by a factor of three, then you have to square that and brightness will actually go down by a factor of one over nine. And so this is uh, in fact, the easy way to think about this. If the distance goes up by a certain factor, the brightness has to go down by the square of that factor. And since three squared is nine, that would be one ninth as bright, almost 10 times fainter for an object that's three times further away. When we go out and look at stars in the universe, uh, we can measure their luminosity. If we know their distance and their brightness, we can measure their luminosity. And when we do that, we find that the most luminous stars in the universe, or at least in our local galaxy, are about a million times more luminous than the sun. And the least luminous stars are about 10,000 times less luminous than the sun. So there is a gigantic range in the actual luminosities of stars in the galaxy. Um, and we'll talk about why that is and how other ways to measure luminosities uh, in the next video. Stay tuned.